Hey, everybody. Welcome to our weekly ecosystem office hours call. I am your host, Jinx, and we are joined, as always, by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. We'll kick things off with uh, Fred. You want to give us a protocol update? Sure, I'll roll through the uh, Grove updates. So uh, on the protocol side for Shannon, uh, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, we have begun onboarding users onto Shannon Alpha Testnet number three. So uh, looking for people to get that up and running and participate in the Alpha Testnet. Um, I'll put the link again to the GitHub issue with some of the info there. Um, in addition, we are looking at how we can use some of the real-world relays from the portal to fuel the testing of Shannon. Um, so this is an exciting thing that we're going to try to do, really battle test Shannon in Alpha Testnet 3. Um, I'll roll into kind of portal uh, updates. Um, we have made all the changes necessary for... Uh, the reduction in max chains. However, there is a separate parameter that uh, for applications that is separate and distinct from the node max chains parameter. So all the shuffling around of app stakes and reducing the max chains from 15 to 8 was uh, unmerited. Apologies for the confusion there. Um, we, we've done everything we can anyways we're reduced to eight on a few apps and then we've already reduced almost all of our apps to one uh chain per stake um so uh yeah that's pretty much it on on the portal we're continuing to monitor uh the gandalf changes from yesterday um there have been a, a few hiccups but nothing major so uh we'll keep watching that and and thanks all the gateways for coordinating um, and communicating through this uh, this step. Um, lastly, uh, with path updates, uh, we are still shooting for first of September, early September for the uh, pre-alpha release is what we're calling it. Um, so stay tuned for there to uh, or to our repo to see uh, some code finally ship. That's it. Beautiful. And uh, Sasquatch. Um, yeah, uh, we, we went through the, uh, the, uh, went through the changing of wrap sticks, um, on Tuesday. Um, so just want to give a quick props to Shane and, uh, Blade and Ramiro and, uh, Ray for chipping in and helping us sort through the issues around that. Um, but got everything fixed up and sent over and dropped down, uh, to three nodes or three chains per node. And everything seems to be going well. Um, had a bit of setback with our our business. One of the new chains that we're going to bring on ended up flaking out. So that's a shame. But um, other than that, we're bringing on a bunch of new users from the Ray Guild ecosystem, like personal projects. So excited to see some, I don't know, just some more um, input from new users. But that's a bit out of it from us. Beautiful. And uh... Sloppy Joe, are you the one who's on the other portal? I'm really trying to keep up, I swear, y'all. Maybe not. Okay. Any other gateway updates? All right. Um, we have our first... Uh, Who's that? Mark, can you mute when you're not talking pretty please? Uh, we have, uh, as a group, been working on getting the uh, multi-chain deployment that uh, Wojtek was working on uh, out and rolling. Uh, v, you got any uh, updates you want to give on that from your side? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the the main update is we have uh, uh, we're getting the initial liquidity uh, distributed to the different uh, exchanges. Um, we started the process with Aerodrome uh, on Base, um, and then next up is Orca on Solana. Uh, the liquidity for uh, Ethereum uh, pocked uh, pocked on Ethereum, uh, which is different than Wrapped pocket but pocked on ethereum that uh has already been seeded 
with liquidity. So yeah, we're we're basically in the process of uh, moving all that liquidity over and uh, uh, yeah, and then Jinx is heading up the kind of marketing front on that end. Beautiful. Um, anybody else uh, have updates they want to contribute to that? All right. Yeah, I'll just say from a from a foundation perspective, we're looking to support um, as as best as possible uh, from uh, for for the multi chain strategy, and uh, we'll be uh, reaching out to the community for some uh, content writers, not just for this, but for some future initiatives as well on a marketing front. Excellent. I'm looking forward to all of that. This has probably been uh, one of the most exciting additions to the ecosystem that I've seen in the last six months. So I'm looking forward to have my pocket spread out across all of the chains. Well, I don't have anything else uh, set on the agenda today. So if anyone else has a topic, question, concern, anything along that line, or need input on something to get shoot on, then feel free to come off mic and kick it off. I'm happy to give a quick update from the foundation, given it's been uh, about a week and a half. That's helpful. Sure. Yeah. So on the operational front, uh, working on getting the final due diligence done from a legal perspective to officially become part of the foundation. Um, outside of that, the full transfer of, of everything from emails to wallets and, and so on and so forth is, uh, is, is basically done. Um, uh, uh, from an economic perspective, um, outside of, of not adjusting um, uh, the RTTTM, um, I'm going to post uh, initial expected changes uh, to the forums on Friday with um, execution on these changes uh, expected the, the following Friday. Um, so a week, a week and a half from now is, is my, my, my expecting here, or my, my expectation here. And um, We've also been really focused this entire week, week and a half, focused on on speaking with our market makers, with our existing market maker and other market makers, uh, investors, and other node runners to understand y'all's cost structure and what we can do to reduce the costs for the network. Uh, we're just trying to get uh, true visibility into the flows, and um, I think we can uh, have more clarity as to what levers to pull as a result. Um, I think the Thing that's probably taking the most time is 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 the budget for us. Uh, we're looking to have something internal by by the end of the week, and uh, the goal is to post our budget roadmap by next week as well. Um, this has just taken a little bit longer to uh, uh, get our heads uh, and hands around. And on the marketing front, uh, we like I mentioned before, we're working on getting um, all of the multi-chain strategy. Uh, moving. Um, this is kind of what I'm viewing as our first major campaign from a foundation perspective. Uh, met with uh, uh, the website uh, folks uh, for the rebrand. Um, I think we're about six to eight weeks from from the new repositioning and the rebrand of the website and Pocket Network being live. Um, like I mentioned before, we're looking for some content writers to help out here, um, either for copy or for uh, some future uh, 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 marketing initiatives. And I would expect, uh, with the help of Jinx and a couple others, um, I would expect to start seeing a consistent heartbeat of content tweets across multiple channels at this point um, uh, in the near future. Um, so that's really the, the, the quick quick update from, from my end. Happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Any questions on that front? No, I would add also on the um, gateway front, um, we actually will have some, I think, fun and exciting announcements um, over these next few weeks, uh, particularly with um, uh, gateways uh, outside of RPC and, and AI. Um, uh, I maintain that one of the most important things that we can do um, is expand uh, the interfaces that Pocket Network can support. and um, 
uh, we are actually in contact with um, some companies to help to help be doing that. So um, the gateway effort continues uh, as expected as well. Beautiful. And and I saw some conversation this morning uh, in uh, Telegram and and also I think in Discord a little bit about. Um, half can y'all give just a little bit of a highlight of of what's to come with that uh, it sounded like there was some some solid strategy and updates there i think it was fred that was talking sorry struggling for the mute button is is the question jinx like what to be expected with path or yeah, I mean, it's a. I think you talked about it a little bit in the Telegram this morning, and I think that uh, it, it, like, the idea of um, Pocket supporting more than just pure RPC calls, uh, and and really expanding out, um, and that's something that we've talked about quite a bit is the future of the protocol beyond just RPC, and we started talking about you know other data types and things along that line. I'd love to get a sense of of what y'all see as the possibility for that. Um, yeah, I can answer, and Mike Rolshansky, if you guys want to chime in, too, uh, be my guest. Uh, I'll start with um, a couple years, right around the time that Portal V2 shipped, we came to the realization that, like, Pocket is, as an ecosystem is, is a data transport layer, and um, it enables the incentivization of suppliers of data. Um, and with that, we architected Portal V2 to be interface and service agnostic from the very beginning, which will all end up in PATH. But the goal of PATH is to enable any gateway to become an API or RPC or permissionless data demand generator on top of the permissionless network. Um, and with that, that obviously opens doors well beyond what we talk about today, which is mostly blockchain RPC, but then there's AI, there's uh, storage protocols, there's compute protocols, there are various data sources and, and other layers that can be interacted with. So the goal and the idea with PATH is to enable those players to come to market on the pocket network and participate in the ecosystem and incentivize the both supply side and uh, generate the demand into the into the network. Yeah, you know, something something I want to add here is that terminology is important, and it also really depends on who the audience is. So the comment I'm about to make is a little bit more a technical audience, but you know uh, the entire pocket community are separate of what we're doing here. Um, we and when I say we, I mean pocket network um, half. Uh, that's being developed at Grove and the other gateways that may provide their own proprietary implementations. I don't think we're going to go beyond RPC anytime soon. Obviously, down the line in the future, anything is possible, but RPC is something that stands for remote procedure call and has was invented in 1981, right? So for the foreseeable future, we are supporting any sort of RPC, right? LLM inference is served via RPC. A request for data is served via RPC. It just so happens that the Web3 industry adopted this term and doesn't think beyond kind of a full node. Uh, but um, the way I see that, you know, in the coming years and the short and midterm, the goal is to support any RPC. And the TAM there alone is going to be, you know, billions, if not billions of dollars before we try to do anything else. Uh, so that's a clarification, but uh, I think it's an important one as, you know, we're all kind of champions of the protocol and the ecosystem um, are called. Hey, Daniel. Um, I, I've been trying to understand, like, the, the, the best way to describe or even just, like, validate my understanding of path. Um, so maybe I, could I just ask you, like, uh, if what I say next makes sense and aligns with what we're thinking. Um, kind of like what, what I am imagining or what I understand is that PATH is going to allow anyone to curate and sell data sources, almost like somebody today can decide to curate and sell products in a specialized store. Uh, but the difference is that 
um, the, 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 the stories for data access. So uh, is that like an accurate analogy? Let's call it uh, not data access, but uh, network access. And a subset of network access is data access. So the purpose of the protocol is to aggregate high quality supply of services, of data, of anything else that can be served over RPC. Uh, that is pocket network protocol. And the purpose of PATH is to access the services, the data, um, or anything else that is provided by the network. So, so it's effectively like an abstraction uh, for uh, you know, marketing and monetization? It is a tool to access Pocket Network easily without thinking about it. Um, if Pocket Network is like a big door with a lot of gold behind that door and uh, like a, a lock on that door that's easy to open, Path is like the key to all of that. You turn the key and then you have access to all the gold on yeah. behind that door in a very easy manner. The incentive for somebody to want to use path um, uh, understanding is that like, if, if I want to position or market or provide access to this gold to other people uh, and, and, and monetize it uh, in some way that's unique to me, then I would be interested in path. Yes. Um, our goal with PATH is to enable uh, end users to spin up an SLA-backed gateway on a pocket network service within hours. Got it. I would say the user, the user flow would be you go to pocket.network or pocketscan.com and you see, oh, damn. Someone, someone is uh, providing services for an LLM fine-tuned on Steve's blog post. And then I'd be like, I want to, you know, get access to this LLM. So within 15 minutes to one hour, I will have my own gateway that can use that easily uh, without sacrificing quality at a good cost. Breezy asks in chat, how is PATH different than the Gateway Kit developed by Nodis? Um, I think this is a good segue. So uh, we recently posted on the forum uh, about our approach to quality of service, which is a major topic on top of these decentralized services. Um, QoS and providing an SLA-backed gateway is core to the tenants of PATH. Like we want to enable people to serve quality service like very quickly. Um, that is one of the major features that we want to ship in PATH. Also, PATH is, um, I'll call it Grove's flavor of the gateway kit, but uh, it is it is a separate and distinct product, um, and we're just hoping to gain traction and gain adoption and uh, have people contribute. And we think that one of the major ways that we can drive contributions to that is through the quality area of, hey, you're a new gateway, you're using Path, you want to launch a service, um, you know, it's you know some blockchain or it's some service that requires unique quality of service, you contribute to the quality of service module, the Path, and voila, now every gateway that is within PATH now benefits from that uh, QoS innovation. One thing I'll add is our goal is just to make uh, services on the network accessible, right? It doesn't matter how we do that, um, whether it's gateway server or PATH or a magic wand. Uh, the goal is to make pocket network as accessible as possible and as accessible as possible to anyone. And we did look into gateway server kit uh, and try to decide if it's uh, if it's easier or less heavy lifting to add some of our quality of service tooling into it. Um, and it was a week long sprint by the team at Grove, uh, and ultimately uh, we decided that it's easier for us to take components from Portal, uh, start cleaning it up in the form of Path. 
uh, inspired by some of the things we saw in Gateway Server, and that we're going to uh, create the best toolkit for anyone who's running Gateway. That answer the question there. Yeah, it did for me. I, I um, the, the the goal, of course, then is like with Path, uh, anybody could go out there and effectively become like a, a provider of uh, RPC endpoints that are you know easy for them to make available and sure have the quality that would be needed to, um, you know, for whoever their end users are to ensure quality. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll also talk through, like Olshansky and I, we met with every single user of Gateway Server today. Um, and the consistent feedback is that Pocket is great and it, it provides a ton of scalability, but the quality has been a missing aspect and it's been difficult to achieve the quality of service necessary for most customers. Um, I, I write a little bit about this in the forum uh, post. There is a, uh, I also published some of the success rate metrics, but um, Web2 left us with some good expect or users with really strong expectations. Um, and that would be, you know, SLAs, four nines or three and a half nines. Um, and, you know, the, the ability to have a service with a specific amount of uptime. And the success rates of the chains without our QoS are in the mid 80s at best. Uh, and with our QS, we have been able to push them above 99% for many of them. Yeah, I just want to jump in with an attempt at another uh, analogy. Uh, kind of what Shopify did for uh, anyone to be able to spin up their own e commerce site. Uh, the goal of PATH is for anyone to be able to spin up their own gateway that provides RPC endpoints with a high quality of service. Uh, Ian asks, don't you think choosing to keep PNI slash Grove's gateway stack and QoS tooling closed source has helped to hurt QoS on Pocket Network globally? Um, this is a very complicated question with a very complicated answer. Um, I write a little bit about this in the blog or in the forum post as well. It's also on our blog. Um, uh, in the very first uh, paragraph, we write that we view Pocket Network as a permissionless adversarial network. And that key word is adversarial. Um, through learning and living, uh, on the Pocket Network for a long time, there are a lot of individuals who are trying to uh, appear to offer a service that they do not or offer a less than acceptable service. And that is a lot of what we have spent time on is ensuring that folks that I would call gamers or abusers um, are not able to continue to win off of our gateway. If we were to open source all of the code at any given time, which we still are planning on, then uh, we all know this from, uh, if you've ever worked at a big company, uh, you usually get like KPIs or metrics, and what does everybody resort to? Well, you immediately game to those metrics. And while some of that is good, uh, a lot of the times people just game the metric as much as they can. And so if we were to say like, this is how we do the archival check, and that is out in the open and not, um, you know, randomized or, you know, perfectly uh, random and, and making it hard to keep up with how that check functions, then everyone would go and hard code their node to respond in, or I won't say everyone, a subset of individuals would go and hard code their node to game and pass that check. And we have absolutely seen that happen in the, in the past, which is why our checks have gotten more dynamic uh, more difficult to anticipate and more difficult to game. Um, and we are actually almost at the point where we use customer relays as checks. Um, so we're, we're getting even more clever as time goes on to stay one, one step ahead of those that would uh, abuse the service offerings. I want to add to this. Um, Brad touched really well on kind of the algorithm side of things. But what I want to what I want to say is that 
public source does not mean open source, right? As an example, if Google, you know, their internal repo is called Google 3, it's a mono repo. If that were to be open source today, you would not be able to run your own Google search engine. And there's a lot more in there. If you look, you know, there were a lot of there were a lot of news around uh, Twitter open sourcing its ranking algorithm. I just checked; no one has contributed to it since it went public, because even though it's public source, understanding it and contributing it to it, and having docs and tooling to iterate on it is what makes something open source rather than just public source. What we're doing with Canon, what we're doing with Pat is through open source and not just public source. And since we are a small team right now, making something public source prematurely uh, will bring more questions than um, kind of benefit to the community and that'll just slow it down. I see Breezy still typing. Let's speed up the process of getting mint burn ratio to one to one, and that would no longer be any issue. Shoot, we will be begging people to game the system at that point. Um, I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that because just because, like, I say, give me the latest block height on optimism, and you respond with hi, and you get pocket for that, I don't think that like the mint burn ratio is, is going to solve that problem. Negative pylori. <clears throat> Disclaimer. Sure. Other thoughts there? Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, uh, with, uh, you know, false responses um, of, you know, like node runners getting rewarded for bad relays. I mean, I think that's kind of the purpose of uh, the um, minimum amount of relays that, a you know, a, a, a surface node ha or a surfacer has to uh, respond to before they um are able to successfully submit a claim and proof so um that would actually you know the, that that level of of gaming where it's just sending complete bs's you know to to this to the uh checks um yeah that wouldn't that wouldn't really fly in uh, uh mm -hmm. even in morse now and then in shannon uh with how the um uh with how the uh uh, what is a distributed uh, or group? Um, uh, anyways, uh, how the tokenomics will work there is uh, the lowest MRG. The low. I'm I'm sorry. I'm getting a little distracted, Miss Kitty. I think you need to mute. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, I just server uh, muted. Yeah, sorry. I was I, I, terrible when that's going on. Um, yeah. In in Shannon, uh, gateways are going to be uh, or, or sorry, nodes that are consistently bad will. Uh, be jailed. Um, and so that, you know, that kind of has a on-chain uh, approach to to that as well. So not only do you need to submit a certain number of relays to even be able to submit a claim as it is now, but then uh, uh, you would need to also be uh, uh, not be in the bottom bucket from multiple gateways uh, in terms of the amount of relays that you're being sent or else you'll potentially be jailed. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of options for preventing that level of kind of blatant um, gaming. Any other thoughts on that front?
see if Breezy's still typing. Can you bring up, there's some paragraph uh, that Ian's written, um, and ultimately I don't generally engage with content that just sounds like people making up accusations and claims against people. Uh, if Ian would like to talk about uh, the open source dynamic checks and have it difficult to game, he's welcome to come off mic and do so. Yep, you got it. Any other thoughts on that front? I see Steve's typing in there as well. Uh, I'll reiterate what Mike said at the beginning of uh, the call. We are looking for people to help create content uh, around a lot of the marketing pushes that we're going to be doing uh, in the short order here, especially in regards to the multi-chain rollouts, which are happening very soon. We are in the process of uh, getting liquidity staked and pools created at this current point in time. So if you are an experienced uh, writer or content creator within the uh, crypto space, we would love to hear from you. In the meantime, while they decide if they come up mute, can I make a quick announcement? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, we are going to be releasing uh, as soon as possible a service for no runners that want to know which is the best strategy to deploy their nodes uh, in the context of candles. We as the number of chains is, is going to be produced, the problems that we had with services with less than the minimum amount of nodes to create a session, I think it will become a larger problem, at least for a while until everyone finds their sweet spot. And uh, we have developed internally a, a service that tells us exactly what we need to, to stake. We are planning to release a public version of that, so no runners can input their their domain name and get a, a list of commands to do all the re restaking and also tell you why you should need to. I I mean, if you put your your domain name, the list of chains that you have uh, available for staking and we will tell you exactly how you should deploy to maximize your earnings. And we hope that with that, and also we are going to be doing some community service for a while, staking at least 24 nodes and all the chains that we support so we can have sessions, but uh, it, will be, it won't be enough. So part of this tool will also enable node runners who wants to provide minimum service to to say, okay, I want to provide a minimum service for this chain and the optimizer will try to optimize having that boundary also in town, like having at least 24 nodes in a given chain, for example. So we are trying to release this as soon as possible, but there is, uh, we have to, to do a little bit of 
JavaScript in on, on top of the internal service that we have. So I don't know if people want this or if we are going to work for nothing. So if no one wants it, we will try to push it. If not, just tell us and we will work for nothing. What's the best way for node runners to coordinate with you on that? You can just write us in the Discord or our DMs are always open, so you can do it. Well, Ben Bang wants it, so that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if Ben Bang say we lose, I will just code it. But basically, the idea here is not like to everyone coordinate each other in a spreadsheet like was the the solution proposed before this. It's like for the best of each node runner on his own. No one needs to coordinate between them. We are going to release yeah. the service for the optimization and the software. I, I am right, right now coding it in Go will be open source will be there for everyone review because basically you need to in somehow provide the keys so it will consume the service of what to stake and after that uh if the number is okay and your setup is okay we'll do the stake for you so in the node the the, the node runner will just need to set every single chain on on his pool so the node will be able to read the chain configuration and response in relationship to what they are at stake for. Nice. It's just another Docker Docker process they need to to set up and and, and run and will be so so low in in resource. It's just uh, something that will have a cron and we'll do the stake for you after the, the process of, of consult and consume what the stake. Has everyone on here uh, reasonably gotten their uh, first round reductions on uh, Gandalf done and in place? I think with the uh, the kind of tooling that uh, Ramiro is talking about, that's probably going to make the next round of strategy a little bit easier. Shane, when is the next step down? We haven't announced uh, the next step down. Uh, we're, I mean, I get the idea is we'll make a change and then we'll give a little bit of time to kind of feel out how the network is is operating already. You know there were some challenges with uh, uh, some node or, or some chains not having quite enough nodes to create a session, um, and so you know evaluate. Okay, if that happened at eight, what are you know what are the likely chances of that happening at three, um, and uh, you know and then especially one. So uh, yeah, basically just take it each step at a time, kind of evaluate, see how that transition went see if uh you know we're in a place where we can go to the next step and then we go to the next step so ultimately it's you know open for people's own thoughts and feedback if they uh uh yeah if they they think it went well or they think there's uh, a better a better process uh in the future then you know right now it's just a time of collecting data is this a place where community chains can help pick up some of the slack from lower traffic uh chains um, I mean, the idea of a kind of open, you know, pooling system, yeah, would, would, would be a kind of solution for that. Um, but not a, uh, but community chains would have to be much bigger than what it is. Uh, and there would have to be kind of more providers on it. Um, so community change right now, I think is primarily like, you know, like 10 chains or something like that. So for the independent node runners, it's great. Um, and at times where it was much larger, uh, yeah, I mean, it could have, it, it was, yeah, it, it could have been used for a number of different uh, uh, low um, low volume chains. 
Um, but yeah, really the, 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 the best solution for this is what Oshansky has already put into a PR, which is um, not having a requirement of a certain amount of nodes to create a session. Uh, and ultimately, once we get down to one, a lot of chains are actually most likely going to be below the required 24, uh, 24 nodes anyways. So um, I, I do feel like that's probably a change that we'll have to see before we get to one. Um, ultimately, with Shannon, we're not going to have that issue um, if we, you know, if we don't set a parameter that requires a certain number of nodes. Because uh, ultimately, I think with Pocket, the goal is as long as there's an available data source that's good, Gateway should be able to access it. Um, and so I don't really see the need for having a uh, some kind of arbitrary parameter where you have to have at least this many nodes on a chain before it would, uh, or on a data source uh, before you can get a session for it. So anyways, that's the that's ultimately the, the best solution. Um, making that change to the protocol, but that obviously requires a uh, uh, a network upgrade. So uh, that, you know, we'd have to go through the the old network upgrade path to being able to have that solution in place. Hey, Shane, is, is there like a hypothetical scenario with uh, the way Gandalf is set up once you get to a point where each node is supporting um, just one chain where um, there might be no nodes willing to support a given chain. Is 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 that like hypothetically possible? Sorry, uh, hypothetically possible that there's no uh, no, no nodes supporting a chain. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's always that that's always been happening in Pocket. <laughs> there there have been times where there uh, haven't been anyone supporting a chain, and uh, uh, you know, Grove. Um, you know, they weren't getting traffic and there wasn't, uh, uh, there was an interest on node runner. So no one's, um, you know, serving it. So it just kind of dies. So yeah, that happens all the time. Well, not but all the time, but it happens. Does it, change, does it change at all? If, if the nodes are only supporting one chain, I guess is my question. Like, yeah, I realize that's always been a thing, but if you've got slots for 15 chains, um, you might just think, ah, oh, like, we're just, like the odds might go up that somebody will slot like those lower, uh, yeah. Popularity chains, and I, I guess that that was what I was trying to understand. Oh, yeah. What ultimately, where where the economics go with with something like Gandalf is, um, instead of someone needing to support fifteen chains, they only need to support one chain, right? And so, the idea here is, if there's a chain that has really small traffic, it might only need a few nodes. Like if there's literally no traffic on that chain. Then yes, no one will want to stake to it. But if there's at least uh, what, like a hundred thousand relays a day, which is absolutely nothing, it's that's still within Grove's one free tier. Um, uh, then there's def then there would be an incentive to at least have you know a few nodes uh, operating on it. You know, like one one or two nodes operating on it. So someone could just sit on that chain and potentially get even more rewards if that one chain goes up from, you know, the big 100,000 to, you know, something higher. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of uh, the, the current model that we have now is, is not good because basically no one can just, no one that's already running uh, a chain node of any of these chains can just join Pocket because you have to support 15 other chains. So that's why we're in this place of we rely on the providers to add a chain. And once a provider adds a chain, then we can truly support it on the network. Um, but it 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 makes Pocket Network reliant on specific providers versus allowing anyone to just come in uh, if they already have a node in that ecosystem. That's ultimately where we're going to have the best the, the best quality of service for small chains is honestly going to come from uh, that chain's own node community. That's that's always been the mission and vision of Pocket. So trying to get our node community to support some small chain is always the challenge versus having a way where that community can just join Pocket and generate extra rewards. Uh, even if it's a small amount of traffic, it just needs a few nodes to, to still be operating on Pocket. 
So um, yeah, just get a few notes from some of these small chains and they could literally make a good return uh, with very small traffic. But uh, compared to the rest of the network, they'd be doing great. I, I think I missed that point. Um, so like, which is really interesting. So like if it, it's almost reversing potentially, like if you have a small chain, you would say, hey, install the pocket node software on your servers versus let's get our node runners to install your node on our servers. Oh, that's exactly it. And, and that's been the whole vision of pocket. Like when we started launching chains at the very beginning. So when we started adding new chains, we we added Fuse, we added uh, Avalanche. Uh, uh these literally the initial chains that we launch we would go to that community and we would advertise uh hey you can double dip uh your existing node community they can join pocket run a pocket node and then they get uh not only can they maybe get validator nodes or, or validator rewards or whatever rewards are on that network uh but you can also utilize your nodes for rpc and so we had uh yeah we had that uh uh, Avalanche Labs or uh, Ava Labs. Uh, we had Twitter AMAs with them. Uh, we actually had quite a few Avalanche folks join Pocket because they love the idea of double dipping and they love the idea of having uh, you know their community powering a decentralized infrastructure. That is way yeah. more powerful marketing than what we've been kind of going down the path of. Hey, we'll get our node runners to run your chain uh you know kind of thing it's a very it's not expanding the node ecosystem so that I, seems to handle yeah i can echo what shane's saying too we've been having a lot of conversation with with our customers who use us for rpc for some chains but also run their internal nodes the question always is like why are you not running them on pocket <laughs> and i i think this is one of the big barriers is like well they run solana but they don't want to run 14 other chains or seven other chains now. And like they have, you know, maybe one or two networks that they support. So um, yeah, I, I can, we can echo and see that this is, this is still a thing. We want, we want experts at the nodes of the chains to come onto pocket network. Yeah, that's super interesting. I don't, for some reason I didn't connect that thinking, but uh, it, it sort of opens up another question that you guys have probably thought about that I'm, um, just now thinking about so like if, if I was another chain um, why wouldn't I just set up pocket nodes to divert like all of my traffic and you know and I wouldn't be paying out em emissions or trying to onboard node runners um, right so why wouldn't I do that but if they did do that how would that benefit pocket because you'd be paying uh, you know rewards to their nodes uh yeah like can you like walk me through the economic side of that equation um one of the value propositions that we always put out when we talk about new chain deals is that uh at some point you don't have to run your own infrastructure <laughs> um yeah, I mean, the, the idea with Pocket is like, if you think about what it takes to operate your own infrastructure and what it takes to operate a block, like blockchain nodes is the example that I'll use because that's what's live today. Then you have basically a, a, an operational fixed cost for the personnel and then you pay for the hardware. Um, and so at some point, uh, if you can get adoption on Pocket Network, then you don't have to run anymore. That's been the value prop that we pitch. Isn't that kind of the, the, the opposite of what we just talked about, like getting them to run pocket? It is. Or... It is. Because our supply side has been eager to come on and participate. But I think as there's more specialized and gateways get more savvy about picking the best nodes, I think this shakes out in the market. So it's maybe just like an alternative uh, path that might make sense for some. Yes. Got one it. of the other, I would say real quick, just one of the other big barriers is that previously when the price was a little bit higher, the, uh, the barrier of capital expenditure to come up with, you know, you need basically 30 nodes to come up and buy 450,000 pocket 
to stake your 30 nodes to get a session has been a, a barrier of entry for a lot of would-be node runners of a specific chain. Sloppy Joe mentioned if new chains were added to Node Pilot, I and likely other Node Pilot users would be glad to help bootstrap new chains. And and that's uh, that's the other thing of this as well. Like people that are already running, um, or people that have uh, that are running nodes on their own hardware, uh, they could easily bootstrap uh, without a monthly cost. Uh, you know, at least the same monthly cost. Um, again, the 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 vision of Pocket was always people running nodes at home, uh, where any node that's out there in the uh, uh, in Web three could just be added to Pocket. Uh, and so, yeah, just getting back to that uh, original vision, where regardless of where the node's coming from, as long as it's able to serve good relays, it should be on Pocket. And to be fair. A lot of these nodes, like if you have an enterprise, uh, uh, an enterprise uh, Aragon node um, that's running on, you know, server grade hardware in a data center, uh, you know, a single node can do up to two hundred thousand requ uh, requests a minute. At least that's where we started to see breakdown when we were testing on uh, uh, on server grade hardware. Um, so two hundred thousand requests a minute. Right now, most pocket nodes are doing. Uh, you know, a few thousand a day. So <laughs> like the amount of traffic that these nodes are doing could actually easily be done on a DAP node, a little DAP node machine, because the throughput of what's required is so incredibly small compared to uh, uh, even what a little DAP node machine could be able to do. So um, anyways, so uh, th there's been this kind of idea that uh, pocket is best when it's only being operated by kind of like professional node runners or something like that. And that's like not, that's just not accurate. It, it, we would be way better off if we had people running chains uh, on all sorts of machines all over the world, right? Um, uh, and yeah, some might not have the most uptime, some might not have the, uh, the best uh, uh, internet. Uh, or uh, you know it, it doesn't really matter because gateways are still able to do QoS checks, and when that node is good, that gives more gateways options. When the node is not performing well, well then the gateway just simply won't send them, uh, you know, the same level of uh, uh, relays as someone else. So there's Pocket's got a lot of place to go grow before uh, the idea of home node running. Uh, would be completely unfeasible, which ultimately a pocket grows in the way that it's expected to, that will never be the case because there there could just always be more people just adding simple nodes uh, to the network. And actually, the more chain nodes that are on the network, the healthier the, the network is going to be as a whole. Um, right now, most chain nodes uh, are controlled by, you know, a, a very, very small number of um, entities. And so... Uh, Everyone's just using the exact. A lot of providers are using the same chain node, right? That's that's the uh, the nature of what Pocket is now. That's actually less healthy for Pocket. Um, so it's a bit of a rabbit trail. But um, the idea of having independent people just running nodes is fantastic. And and uh, like you know, Grove in the past has mentioned having QoS issues with chains. They never had QoS issues because an independent single node runner was having issues that suddenly brought Grove down. It was when a large node runner that commands tons of nodes had a chain node problem, uh, and then it affected a large part of that chain. So, you know, there hasn't been QoS uh, problems because, you know, one out of a thousand nodes uh, running NodePilot, uh, you know, went down because of, you know, internet connection or ran out of storage or whatever. You know, that I'll, hasn't uh, stopped any chain. <laughs> uh, well, I'll pause you there and say, as of this morning, Gnosis mainnet is being tanked because all it's run almost exclusively by indies and not a single one out of 100 plus providers is providing a backend node that works. Um, this is probably mm -hmm. due to backend consolidation, though. That's, um, that's, that's exactly it, yeah. 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 The other, the other thing to add there, Shane, in my uh, 
the amount of, like more worse you work uh, is on the economic side uh the more you have the less each is going to make versus the fewer you have the more they're going to make so it, it also incentives are, are are important like you know it's, it's just like you pay more people less or fewer people more it really depends on the quality uh in my opinion too uh because otherwise um you know if you kind of pay more people more the emissions just go way way up and it just becomes too expensive yeah but what the benefit of if people that are running those chains already um joining joining the network or or say they already have a, a home server tons of people when pocket started they just went out and bought a, a server because they could you know run a few blockchains on it and make a good reward someone right now even if someone takes a uh uh takes a a server or old computer that they have at home and they uh were to if gandalf were to go down to one they would actually be making a decent amount for that hardware probably more than what uh they would be making rewards on other networks uh for doing validation or something uh because you could you know you could yeah you can actually have a good return on on the hardware itself uh still yet so um really what this would do is it would just make it easier for people that uh want to join to join and they don't have to join by going to a provider because ultimately people that are already running nodes they could decide hey if i run this myself i could be making you know potentially more money and i don't have to uh because i already have the hardware at home so i'm not going to stake with a staking provider um so it, it's not necessarily uh what, what what it's doing is it's just making more options for more chain nodes to enter a space because someone could either decide to go with a provider or they could decide to go with um uh, running it, running it themselves. And we want to have that option because that option doesn't exist right now because you have to, you know, run 15 or now eight, you have to run eight other chains. You can't just run one chain on a server. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it's, it's not eating away, um, at the, the quality or, you know, m making us need to mint more. It just means people are able to retain more of their rewards because they are running it on a machine at home, which actually adds a new chain node to Pocket, which is desperately what Pocket needs right now, so that we don't have these uh, large uh, providers that if they go down, you know, it's it's it, it suddenly, you know, kills an entire chain. And once we get down to one, that becomes a, a potential increasing risk um, because, uh, yeah, there, there, there may be less providers Per chain, um, but even even that, I mean, multiple providers are still using the same backend anyways for a lot of these. Um, so, anyways, we got to decentralize and allow more chain nodes, not pocket nodes. We're talking chain nodes to enter, and by allowing people to run one, they can easily do that with their own hardware. So that's a benefit to pocket over just going to a staking provider who is running uh, the same chain node and just adding another pocket node to it. Yeah, I agree with that logic in a scenario like a Gandalf scenario where you're talking about a small chain and uh, like one provider or a few providers. I'm not sure I agree with it if you're talking about like a really high traffic chain and trying to aggregate lots of providers just to provide like good quality uh, for a high traffic chain. But this is always, and, and maybe this is a good spot to, to close out here uh, for our session since we're over. Uh, this is also why the variable RTTM was created for, you know, variable rewards based on things like complexity and difficulty. Some nodes are hard as hell to run. They're massively resource intensive and, you know, those should be uh, rewarded at a higher rate than, you know, something that's easy to run and broadly supported. And I think that those economic incentives can help uh, uh, drive adequate configuration of the network around these chains as well. Um, I would love to see an ongoing conversation around this in the forum. If anybody has links to share to posts that they've already made that they want to uh, drive some additional traffic to, then uh, please feel free to drop them in chat. But for now, thanks everyone as always for coming out for our call and we'll see you next week, same time, same channel, but by a different host, I'll be heading out for uh, Korea Blockchain Week. So I believe uh, Alex Crypto Corn is gonna take over the next one for us. Thanks, Joe. Looking forward to it. Thanks, all. Thank you.